Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, This Week in America. It's likely that a woman first said, remember the Alamo. It's also likely that Asian, Buddhist, and Muslim pioneers fought and died at the Alamo. Joe, the only male survivor, said that all races and religions were there. Joe's Alamo, unsung by Lewis E. Cook, shows how it happened. The novel is inclusive of all races and religions, just as Joe described. Its characters reflect the real personalities of Alamo defenders. It includes recently discovered facts about William Travis, Joe, Susan Dickinson, and Davy Crockett. Lewis was a science major, pre-med biology and chemistry at the University of Arkansas. He was hired by the Houston Independent School District to teach biology and science classes. But due to scheduling, he had one Texas history course. He found Texas history very fascinating, and the result is historical fiction, Joe's Alamo Unsung, Women and Minorities at the Siege. Rave reviews. One, the novel focuses equally on the abhorrent, the noble, and the large gray area in between. One calling it the best Western novel they've read since Lonesome Dove. Winner of the 53rd Annual World Fest 2020 Remy Award, and Lewis E. Cook, author of Joe's Alamo Unsung, is our guest on This Week in America. Lewis, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Rick. That was an excellent introduction. I appreciate it. Well, I'm trying to jump into this with everything to talk about here, and it's fascinating. And I, you know, I'm just reading the background, getting ready to read the book. I'm so impressed with the information you've got here. Let's start with, I didn't want to give away too much there. Talk about the uh, the book a little bit, Joe's Alamo Unsung. I men- mentioned some important points that I never really knew about before. Yes, there are some important points that I like the readers to get and go with as well. In fact, the first one is the one you mentioned. It's likely that a woman is the first person to say it, remember the Alamo. And it's also very clear and very obvious from doing some work on this uh, project that almost every race and every religion were also at the Alamo. I'm talking about Muslims and Jews, Buddhists, Catholics, Christians, all were there and all fought and died for our independence here in Texas. And, of course, the other interesting point that I thought was very, very ironic is that the Yellow Rose of Texas, who made famous by that song, is probably, in fact, was a black lady named Emily. That's just amazing. And I talk about this, Joe. Talk about him. He was a slave and the only survivor. Correct. He was a slave and the only survivor. And... He survived, not intentionally, he was wounded severely twice, but he survived because he was so severely shot that he just passed out. And um, Susan, the Susan Dickinson, who was the uh, wife of Captain Dickinson, who was over the uh, artillery, she had a small child. So everybody in the Alamo, all the heroes and defenders, made an effort to protect her and to keep her and her child safe and uh, away from the the harm. So how she actually survived, because it was a big confusion, is unknown. But she actually did, along with her toddler, Angelina. And those are the three major survivors of the Alamo. Joe, a slave of William Travis, Susan Dickinson, the wife of Emily and O. Dickinson, and their child, Angelina. You know, it's such a fascinating book by our guest on the program, Lewis E. Cook. The bow is uh, the book is Joe's Alamo Unsung. Book available at Amazon, the usual places. I'll give you two websites, Joe's Joe websites for the book that you can go get information. Joe's Alamo dot com and Joe's Alamo Unsung, which is the title dot com. Lewis, I, I did a little background there that uh, you taught uh, pre med major, taught biology, chemistry, and science to junior high school students. Talk about, I just touched on it briefly, getting Texas history, and you're told, what, just stay a a chapter ahead of the kids, but you had a kid that really pushed you, and you suddenly realized, hey, I like what I'm finding out about Texas history here. That's always uh, brings a a smile to my face, (laughs) because um, that's what I was told. I said, look, we know you don't know any Texas history. You're a chemistry major. You sit over here. The kids don't know anything. Just stay a chapter ahead of them. But some of those kids, I mean, Texas history is a a statement of pride in this area. And kids learn it very early, and they learn it well. 
and I, there's no way I could have bluffed through that semester because one of those kids' fathers actually taught American history at the University of Houston, and that kid was really smart. I had my roll book. I kept it for years, and due to a flood, or uh, some floods, I lost his name and the names of the other kids that I taught. I regret that, but I hope those kids learn that I uh, learned from them, and they inspired me. They made me, actually, Rick, they made me go and learn some Texas history because I couldn't bluff them, and I wasn't going to be embarrassed by them all the time that I was sitting in the classroom, <laughs> and I really had uh, bad feelings about spilling out you know, unprepared information. So they made me do my work and do it well, and I found Texas history to be fascinating, and I can see why so many Texans take pride in it, because it is an excellent story, and uh, the information about William Travis and following him, which is what this novel does, it follows him and his lifestyle. He was actually born in one state, South Carolina, then traveled to, uh, to Alabama, and then to Texas. Uh, it's a fascinating story of itself, but that's how I got involved, and um, that's how those, uh, those kids inspired me to become a not only a great teacher, but inspired this book. Well, it's really interesting. You take it on as an assignment. It's okay. I guess I have to. And suddenly you not only are very enthralled with this, you really enjoy this. You start working on this book and the book is, is so well done. Joe's Alamo unsung by Lewis E. Cook, the uh, book available at uh, Amazon, the usual places. I'll give you Lewis's uh, websites as we go through the program. It's interesting, too, in your career, you sort of took this by, by accident when they threw this course on you. Uh, how did you decide to change direction from medicine in, into law? Because that was another, another path you took that you didn't think you were going to. That's another part of my uh, background that I found fascinating. I had no intentions of going to law school. My interest was to go to medical school. I looked around when I was still in Arkansas and saw that um, most of the surrounding border states only had one or maybe two. I think Oklahoma had a very good medical uh, veterinarian school, but uh, all of them had about one or so medical schools, just like Arkansas. But Texas had about seven. So I got in my, as Isaac Hayes would say, in 1965 forward and drove here immediately and applied to all of them. And I got back one one very thin letter that says, Dear Stupid. It really didn't say Dear Stupid, but that's how I interpreted it. It said, Dear Stupid, you are not a Texas resident. You have to live here a year before you can claim residency. And I had a year to burn. That's really what, how it happened, Rick. I didn't know what to do for the year, so I said, Obviously, I don't know any law. I'm going to go over to the law school and see if I can learn something. And uh, the dean over there said, Look, at, we got 400 people who want that seat. Why should I give it to you? Uh, I had a decent resume, and I think I must have talked myself or backed myself into uh, him saying, well, I'll give you a conditional admission, but you got to do the same thing that everybody else does. And um, after he did so, and I had to take a minimum number of courses, I think four, um, I found it amazing. I mean, everybody should know it all. And, yes. of course, we're required to as lawyers, but every citizen um, get a good lawyer, but my goodness, there's a lot of stuff we are incumbent upon us to know that we don't know, we can't know because we all different, different, have different careers. But uh, a good lawyer can can direct you pretty well. You know, it's so I get. Yeah, it's fascinating. Lewis E. Cook is our guest on the program. You've had several experiences in life that didn't work out like you thought they were going to be getting sort of dumped on you. The Texas history, you made the most out of that. The fact that uh, you're not able to get into medicine school, you get into law. It, it's amazing. There's some personal lessons there, what, what Lewis went through and how he's been able to uh, survive and, and to succeed by these different, uh, different decisions that have been made sometimes for him as he went through life. The book is Joe's Alamo Unsung. The book is a work of fiction based on historical facts. That's always interesting. Uh, when you went into that, how did you uncover this new telling of the Alamo story and put it into this form where we almost feel like we're there with these people? It, it made me do it because the information was so fascinating. Well, years ago when I was a kid, and I'm probably older than you, um, I saw 
the Alamo, and I think it was a television version of it. And at the end of it, very end of it, after the flag went up and you saw somebody swinging up a rifle, a black guy just suddenly appeared. All of, and I think, where in the world? I didn't see him in any of the other. So that was Joe. And that urged me to find, was that a real guy? And it is a real guy. Joe was <clears throat> William Travis's slave. And I follow his development just as Williams' development, both coming from the same uh, Alabama area to Texas and made that the story. Now, these are real people. Joe is yes. real. John is real. Uh, but the information about them is so scarce. There's a bit here. Someone said something about him here. There's someone said something about him there. And that's what you have to go to to get that information. But once you dig through it and put together a, a neat little pile of information, it makes for a fascinating read. It makes for a fascinating Texas history, even better than the one we that I grew up with. Well, it, it really is. And I can remember vividly that movie that you're talking about. So we're probably pretty close to the same age. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And the surprise, the surprise when you see that. And the other surprise is not too many people know about the minority contributions to the Alamo battle. Why did you choose to, to recognize all the races and religions that, that fought side by side? Because that's exactly what the survivors said. <laughs> Joe and Emily, excuse me, Joe and Susan Dickinson both said that every race and every religion was at the Alamo. Now, that's a broad statement. So in order to give it its best interpretation, you give it a broad interpretation. That would mean that all major religions are there. And if all major religions are there, that would certainly include Catholics and Buddhists and Muslims and all the others that we can think of. I couldn't fit all of the religions in the world in the novel, but I definitely included enough to show that we have a good reason to take pride in Texas and Texas history. And I'm talking about all of our religions and all of our ethnic groups, because we've already bled for Texas and died for this great place that we call home. I do anyway. Joe's so Alamo. That's how it, it was, yes, I didn't mean to cut you yes. off there. Joe's Alamo, I'm saying, is a realistic interpretation of those facts. It is a fascinating read. And with us on the program is the author, Lewis E. Cook. Uh, book Joe's Alamo, Unsung, available wherever books are sold. To, two of the websites that uh, Lewis has, Joe's Alamo, Unsung.com. I'll give you that one because that's the name of the book. It's easy to remember. How do the characters reflect the real personalities of the Alamo Defenders, do you think? Well, I believe the book is very true to that because um, in most of the interpretations, uh, William Travis is looked upon as a hothead and uh, the guy who's impunctual and um, spontaneous. Yes. And uh, David Crockett, David Crockett, a real senator from Texas, and he definitely did have a, a, a rifle. He called, uh, I think he called it Betsy. And Jim Bowie was a lifelong Texan. Him and um, Juan Seguin lived in this area until San Antonio, San Antonio, until General Santa Ana tried to drive them out. So these real persons actually have a history in the history books that we can read and we can decipher. And in doing so, it was absolutely terrible to brush off William Travis as a hothead because he was a teacher, he published newspapers, he was a lawyer, and he came to Texas because he had trouble with a divorce and probably could have brought Joe with him. We're not sure about that. Um, David Crockett actually came to uh, Texas from Tennessee because he had lost an election, an election he expected to win. And since the elections were just the other day, that was appropriate. And the other guys, once again, and uh, Sam Houston, and um, uh, the first one who I like to mention most frequently is uh, Stephen F. Austin, who has a school after him. He was the beginning of, he brought the first 300 people here to Texas as uh, the founding members of uh, the organization from a land grant from the old Mexican um, country. So these guys' personalities are in the literature of their actual 
of, of the actual history. And when you glean that well, you'll see that William Travis was a complicated guy. So was Crockett. So was Bowie. So was William. So was uh, 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 Travis. And so was Sam um, Sam Houston. I mean, excuse me, excuse me, Stephen F. Austin and Joe and Emily and it, I regret to say John. John was also he probably was part Native American or might have been all then, might be just raised by them. But John was also an uh, instrumental factor in Texas history. He's the only person listed as being a black person in the present archives, but he's listed as a black boy, which is kind of insulting. Well, it, it is. And most of those names you mentioned are names we're familiar with. We learned something new about them in Lewis E. Cook's book, Joe's Alamo Unsung. Talk a little bit about two relatively unknown characters highlighted in your book, the slave Joe that you mentioned, and uh, and Susan Dickinson as well. Well, Joe and Susan Dickinson, who were the survivors, they survived the Alamo, where 200, actually less than 200 people, fought against 5,000 of General Santa Ana's soldiers for 13 days. But you got to recall what was going on at the time. Since Santa Ana was advancing his army to take over, he was trying to get to the uh, the capital of Texas at the time, which is a moving place, and kill, or, well, probably kill, uh, Stephen F. Austin, and Sam Houston, and Jim Bowie as well. <clears throat> but he relied on John, uh, excuse me, Joe and Susan Dickinson to spread the story that he was going to come and kill everybody. He wanted them to know that standing up against them was going to be a bad thing for them to do. They did their job, but they did it in reverse of what Santa Ana expected. They talked about the bravery. They talked about how these 200, less than 200 people fought knowing the outcome but knew that it was something worth fighting for, independence, freedom. And that's the story that must be highlighted in any statement about the Alamo, that not only they knew the outcome, but they did so knowing that even if they died, when they died, they were doing it for a good cause. We should stand on their shoulders proudly because we do. You know, it's interesting, Joe and Susan had hard lives, didn't they, after uh, uh, Texas won its independence? Yes, they did, uh, Rick. Actually, um, the, the the temperament of Texas had been changing, had been changing slowly for years. And since William Travis was actually killed at the Alamo and Joe was considered property, the idea was, well, send Joe back to to Alabama, and Joe would have none of that because he had grown up and become a man in this area. So he had to essentially say, no, I'm not going to go back and run away from the place where he had actually fought to liberate. And then Susan Dickinson, who had become a widow and raising a little small child during the, after the Alamo, had no support. So she went from husband to husband to affair to affair and probably for a while was a street woman. Hate to say it, but that's what I mean. Yes. Until she finally found her footing and had a decent marriage. During that time, they applied as survivors of the Alamo. They applied to be to receive a pension and were denied. Now, I, I say that because they were denied, and they were actually survivors and actually defenders of the Alamo. There were so many persons who claimed that status, who were given that pension, who did not deserve it. But the records, there were no records. It was scattered. They barely did an interview of Joe and Susan to find out what they knew about the strength of Santa Ana's army. So it's just such I, can a... understand, I can understand that. 
that mistake. It's such a, a remarkable story and so well told by Lewis E. Cook, the author and our guest, Joe's Alamo Unsung. A couple minutes left in the in the program here. What do you hope people, this is a, a really different take on the Alamo. This is like such a remarkable story that you've written, again, receiving excellent reviews. What do you hope people take away from reading your book? Well, this is important, too. The Alamo was a massacre as far as Texas was concerned because almost everyone there was killed. But Texas became free based on the the defenders of the Alamo because they gave uh, Sam Houston the opportunity to develop an army, although he was running and staying ahead of Santa Ana in doing so. They gave him an opportunity to build an army and get a strategy so that he did win. Sam Houston did win our freedom at San Jacinto. And in so doing, the second big point that I really want people to understand is that we've heard this song for years and years. years. The Yellow Rose of Texas. There's a lady named Emily who was described as a mulatto who actually did delay Santa Ana's assault using her wit and her charm, if you will. And that gave Sam Houston the opportunity to sneak up and then capture, uh, finally, Santana. Yeah. So the song, The Yellow Rose of Texas, the original words of that song describe her as a black woman, but it's been changed oh, yes. since then. So those are the points. It's an excellent story. It's an excellent history. We are all proud of it because almost 14 states were of carved either in part or in whole out of Texas after we won at San Jacinto. Sam Houston did, of course. And um, that that essential point that we did win based on the information from the survivors of the Alamo and that the Yellow Rose of Texas helped delay the slot, the, in, the onslaught, so that um, Sam Houston could get his revenge and capture General Santa Ana. It's a remarkable story, so well told. I am so glad they made you teach that Texas history class, or we wouldn't have known all of this information that's, that's out there now. I'm going to take about 30 seconds here at the end. Uh, you're such a, a talented writer in bringing this story to life. What are you working on now? Are you working on another book? Uh, you know, um, Rick, having a contact with Texas and having video now far longer than I was over in Arkansas, I looked at another important point. And this is around the time of the big shootout. Everybody in Texas and Arkansas, for me, was the big shootout. Around the time of the big shootout, which is like 69 or 70, black people in Arkansas started developing, and then nationwide, just not there, but I can focus on Arkansas, start developing a particular fair amount of pride in ourselves and our dignity, and particularly our skin and our hair. But that, that was aided by a white woman named Bo Derrick. And I'm writing that story. I'm writing, it's called Razor Black, <laughs> the story of kinky hair and how it became characteristic of pride instead of insult. Well, I'm that's the that's the story I'm working on now. You've got my attention now, and uh, I hopefully have a chance to uh, to talk about that book as well. The book that we are focused on today is Joe's Alamo Unsung by Lewis E. Cook. Book available, of course, at Amazon, the usual places. Lewis's two websites joesalamo.com and joesalamounsung.com. We've got all those on our website this week in america.us. Lewis, a pleasure meeting you, having you on the program. Excellent job with the book. It's a fascinating read. It's uh, it's almost must reading uh, for people to get. We do all grew up with, uh, remember the Alamo and Davy Crockett and all of this. Here's a different side. Here is the story and the sacrifices that, that went into that. Thank you for sharing the story with us on the program today. I really appreciate it, Rick, and um, I, I just thank you for the opportunity to tell uh, this information and get it out to your viewers and listeners because I think they will enjoy it, and I appreciate your uh, your statements regarding my book. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Once again, Joe's Alamo Unsung by Lewis Cook. Information on our website, This Week in America.us, and we're back on today's program after these messages.
You're listening to This Week in America with Rick Bratton. More after this.